Okay, so I, I want to begin sort of uh, setting the table as it were theologically, okay? So I mentioned in a previous podcast that, that Paul's Christology, um, n not you, Paul, Paul of, Tar Paul of Tarsus. <laughs> you Paul have of a Tarsus. Christology, by the way, but it's not the same as the Apostle Paul's, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mm. pa pa Paul's Christology, in essence, was a composite of Jewish and Greek ideas, okay? That is to say, Jewish and pagan beliefs. And by pagan, I simply mean non-Jewish. So I'm not using the word uh, pagan necessarily in a derogatory sense. Okay, so Paul created this new uh, hybrid religion, and religion in the Hellenistic world tended to be syncretistic. I mean, they would mix and match different elements. This was normal. And Paul was schooled in Hellenistic philosophy. Paul quoted pagan poets, according to the New Testament, to support his Christology. He quoted pagan poets in the New Testament to support his Christology. This is something that Christian apologists don't like to talk about. And most casual Bible readers are not even aware of this. They just read the text and don't know what Paul's saying. Paul quoted the Phinomena's hymn to Zeus by the pagan poet and Stoic, Eretus of Soli, according to Acts 17, 28 at the Oropicus. And he also quoted the poet Menander in 1 Corinthians 15, 33. I mean, talk about the satanic verses. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just kidding. Mm. Um, <laughs> Paul made Christ, right, the Jewish Messiah, the locus, the intersection of two pagan beliefs. So Christ is both the dying and rising Savior man-God, as well as the divine mediator between the God and humanity. And by the God, I mean the perfect being who is at the top of this ontological hierarchy or pyramid that permeates all existence. So this, this hierarchy or, or chain of being is absolutely central to both Middle and Neoplatonism, okay? And, and I want to make a request of the audience to study Middle and Neoplatonism, and you will come to know the true origins of the Trinity. I mean, Christian apologists will say that the doctrine of the Trinity is firmly grounded in the Tanakh. In my view, that's a red herring. Uh, they want to throw you off the scent of Greek metaphysics. I mean, study Philo of Alexandria, Okay, so he was a Jewish Middle Platonic philosopher living in Egypt in the first century. He died around 40 of the Common Era before the writing of the New Testament. Okay, there's no doubt that Philo's writings influenced the doctrine of the Trinity in a significant way. Even William Lane Craig admits this. You know, Dr. Craig is their champion, They're the Christian apologists. You know, they love him. The early uh, Christian Greek fathers, they used Philo's writings <clears throat> as a basis with which to formulate their Logos Christology. People like uh, Justin and Irenaeus, Eusebius, who was Constantine's sort of spin doctor, uh, even claimed that Philo met Peter, right? I mean, it's a total fabrication. I mean, this was Eusebius's way of bolstering Philo's authority, similar to Paul claiming that he met with Peter uh, and James. Maybe he did. I mean, it doesn't end well, according to Acts 21. But Craig says that the dogma at Nicaea was, quote, a synthesis between John's gospel and the thought of Philo of Alexandria and the middle Platonism that he represented, end quote. I mean, I would go even further and say that uh, John's gospel itself was clearly influenced by middle Platonism. Oh, yeah. So, so, so Dr. Craig even downplays, in my opinion, the reality of the vast influence that Greek metaphysics had on both Christian doctrine and Christian scripture, and we'll and we'll see that. Okay, well, this, so, this, so is common, this is a commonplace in um, historical theologies. It's not just you and William Lane Craig. That this is very very standard uh, understanding right. and explanation of the origins of the way the doctrine is formulated. Uh, so, yeah, this yeah. is very very standard, very yeah. very standard across the board, right? Um, so any honest historian or theologian, you know, they will point this out. So, so, so according to this Platonic metaphysical system, at the top of this hierarchy of being is the one, right? Tahen, as Plotinus uh, referred to him. The, the church father Origen of Alexandria called him the autotheos, right? The very God. And of course, Philo called him hatheos with the definite article, the God. And this is also what John's gospel calls the father. Hatheos, okay, with the definite article. Um, you know, the... the uh, uh, the author of John's gospel never refers to Jesus or the son as ha theos in an absolute and unqualified way. And, and Thomas's so-called confession in John 20 is not an exception to this. So John refers to Jesus as the logos 
and a theos, a God. So if you look at John 1, 1, right? N-R-K, ain halagos. Kai halagos prastan theon, right? So, so in the beginning was the word, and the word was with the God. Tan is a definite article here in the accusative. Tan theon, kai theos, and a God was the logos. So Middle Platonism explains what John meant here much more coherently than Tanakhi Judaism or Trinitarianism. In Middle Platonism, the Logos was believed to be the second God, a second level of being who was generated from uh, within the one himself in pre-eternality. So since the Logos was generated or caused by the God, the Logos is not as great as the God. The Logos is the divine mediator between the God and humanity. Hence, you know, the Father is greater than I, says John's incarnated Logos. Yet he also says the Father and I are one. So, so Christian apologists, armed with the nomenclature of Nicaea, uh, they went back to these texts and said, oh, okay, when he said the Father is greater than I, the Logos was talking about his hypostasis, his person. But when he said the Father and I are one, he was referring to his usia, his essence. So they incorporate this, this convoluted language and retroactively import uh, a Trinitarian hermeneutic upon, John, upon John's gospel and thus completely decontextualize it. I mean, it's a nice little sleight of hand, but read John in its context. Right? John's underlying metaphysic is middle Platonism. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, 70 years before John wrote about the Logos, Philo wrote about the Logos, and Philo referred to the Logos as a second god, deuteros theos, and Origen would use the same phrase some 200 years later, but still before Nicaea. You know, he said the Father is autotheos, the very God, the Son is- an important God. point, because the very language that John uses actually has a precedent in, um, in the pagan language found on the lips of Philo of Alexandria. So it's not a, it, it's, this continuity, this connection is really important, I think. It is very important. And, you know, Origen also, he uses, like you said, he uses that phrase from Philo, deuteros theos, that the Logos is a second God. The Johann and Jesus, right, uh, jo or John's Logos, refers to his father as Theon Mu, my God, right? my God. So in, in Mark and Matthew, Jesus, you know, the cry of dereliction, Elahi, Elahi, Lama Sabathani, my God, my God. So the Logos, who's supposed to be God, capital G, according to Trinitarians, has a God. So this is clearly two gods. And, and both men, Philo and Origen, they hail from Alexandria. And, you know, the name says it all. You know, this is why Imam al-Ghazali vehemently condemned the metaphysical positions of the Hellenistic Muslim philosophers of his day because he recognized that Platonic metaphysics acted as a gateway to the theological deviations and idolatry of the people of the book, both Jews and Christians of the past, not just Christians, no, but no. also Jews. And no. as I said, for Philo, the Logos was the highest of the intermediary beings, okay? The begotten son of God, he says. Philo says. He says his firstborn, he says the celestial high priest, right, who was often symbolized in the Tanakh by an angel. All right, this is according to Philo. The Logos as the mind of God, as it were, was neither uh, uncreated in the same sense as the God, nor created in the same sense as the cosmos. The Logos was caused from the very essence of the God, uh, meaning the Logos was eternally generated, i.e. begotten, not made, before all the ages. Sounds very, very familiar. Sounds like the Nicene Creed. You know, Justin Martyr, the father of Logos theology, he, he admits that there are disturbing parallels between his Christology and the pagan myths of Bacchus, that's Dionysus, and, and, and Hercules, and, and Asclepius, and Perseus, and Mithras. And in his dialogue with Trifo, Justin accounts for these similarities by claiming, well, the devil sort of emulated the prophecies of Christ by inventing these sort of fake fables about yeah. their pagan gods in order to cause Christians to go astray. I mean, Justin also says that the angel that Jacob wrestled in Genesis and beat, no less, was the pre-incarnate Christ, the Logos. So, so John 1.1 1, 1 is the beginning of the prologue of John's gospel. That's called the hymn to the Logos. How does the hymn end, right? So the most authentic reading, according to New Testament textual critics like the United Bible Society, Nestle Allen, and so on and so forth, is the following. So this is John 1.18, right? John 1.18, that's the end of the hymn to the Logos. It says, Theon udes, heora ken popate. So no one has ever seen God. And the context clearly suggests that John is talking about the first level of being, the Father, the God. Because then he says, monogenes theos, a unique God. 
a one-of-a-kind God, a uniquely generated God. Now John is talking about the Logos. The Logos is another God because he was seen. The first God he mentioned has never been seen, right? The monogenes theos, it's, it goes on to say, who is in the heart of the Father. It says, ekenas exegesato, that one exegetes or explains or reveals the Father. So the Son is the divine mediator. And then John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. The Son is a savior man God, a human sacrifice. So then the second level of being, referred to as the Logos by middle Platonic writers, such as Philo and John, is still a divine being. He is a theos, he's a God, but he's not ha theos. He's not the God or the auto theos, the very God. So this is called henotheistic polytheism, okay? This is not the yesiduth, this is not the Unitarian, you know, monotheism of the Tanakh, uh, nor is this the Trinitarian monotheism of the fourth century of the common era. This is henotheistic polytheism. This is what the Gospels and Pauline epistles teach in my view, okay? The Gospels, suffused with Greek ideas and, and influenced by Paul's Gospel, teach that Jesus is another God, a lesser God, who mediates between the unseen perfect being and humanity by becoming a human sacrifice. So he is the son of God, not God the son, right? And of course, Paul wrote 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5, really that's pseudo Paul, right? 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6. But this represents Paul's thinking, uh, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. And then he goes on, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. So we have the mediating logos, dying for our sins. Now, Paul never referred to the mediator as the Logos, but clearly this is the concept he has in mind. Paul uh, did refer to Christ as the wisdom of God, Theosophion, and of course Philo had already identified Chokmah in the Old Testament, divine wisdom, uh, as being the Logos explicitly, right? Like in Proverbs chapter 8, right? The, the personified and expressive Logos, according to Philo, spoke of its origin. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way, before his work of creation, I was poured forth from eternity, from, from before the creation of the earth. Uh, and Paul, being a highly Hellenized Jew that he was, echoed this Philonic uh, sentiment. I mean, Paul wrote to the Corinthians that he was speaking of the wisdom of God and mystery, which was ordained by God before the ages of our glory. In the, in the Pseudo-Pauline book of Colossians, the author said, and he, the Son, is before all things, and by him all things are held together. This is Middle Platonism. This is Stoicism. Okay. Additionally, and again in imitation of Middle Platonism, Paul envisioned a henotheistic and hierarchical scheme of divinity with God our Father at the top, and then the Lord Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God, i.e. the Logos, just below him. Right, so Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, he says, Pantas andros e kephale ha Christas este. So he says, the head of every man is Christ. Kephale mm -hmm. he, uh, de uh, gunekas ha, ha aner. And the head of, of, of the woman is the man. Right? So the feminists, they don't, <laughs> they don't like this verse. Uh, no. Kephale de Christo ha theos. It's an extraordinary passage because the hierarchy, the divine hierarchy and the human hierarchy is, is ontological. We're, we're dealing here with Jesus after his resurrection, after the ascension. This is yeah. the theology that Paul really believes in. And that is God, Christ, and then subservient to that man and woman. And uh, exactly. it is, there's nothing Trinitarian about it at all. On the contrary, yeah. is, is as you say. Exactly. It's a hierarchy of being. And the head of Christ is ha theos, he says at the end. Exactly. The God. Yes. Okay, the yeah. Father is the God. Jesus Christ is the Lord. These two are not ontologically equal for Paul. Okay, I, 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 I just, just say, uh, so just so people understand here how Christians deal with this, uh, I, I, I've had the honor and the privilege also to speak to Professor Dale Martin from uh, Yale University. He's one of the, the world's great uh, New Testament scholars. He's also a Christian theologian and a Trinitarian. And he discusses this very, very passage and how he deals with it in his uh, most uh, recent work, which is addressed to these whole, all these hermeneutical issues. How do we, how do we be Trinitarian Christians in the light of what you're saying, Dr. Aliotai? And he says, well, when you read passages like that, what you do is you read them in a Trinitarian way and you insert the, the son and father language. You understand it in that way. You read it in a Trinitarian way. So he's very explicit, he's very open and candid about what you do. You don't take Paul's meaning, you take the later meaning and you read it in. And, yeah, and he's, I mean, he's very open about it. He's very, yeah, he's very honest and open. That's exactly how, how you read it. 
I mean, on, on the surface, the plain meaning here is very clear. You know, the one who has authority over Christ, a God, is the God. And this is further made clear by Paul's statement. He says, whether Paul or Apollos or Kephos or the world or life or death or things now or things to come, all things belong to you and you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. Yeah. <clears throat> right? It's very good. Right. Finally, we read in, 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 in the Pseudo-Pauline book of Ephesians, the God of our Lord, Jesus Christ, the God, just think about this thing, the God of our Lord, Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. Again, in John, the Logos, the Johannine Jesus, refers to the Father as my God, as well as the only one who is truly God in, in John 17, 3. Of course, Trinitarians will disagree with these assertions. Uh, they will quote Paul's famous hymn to Christ in Philippians 2 as being sort of a proof text of their position that Paul maintained that Christ was essentially equal to God. So Paul said, uh, uh, he said that Jesus Christ, he said, being in the form of God, did not think it was robbery to be equal with God. But, but here's a problem. If, if Christ was God, the God, why would he even consider the notion that it was robbery to be equal to himself? This is nonsense. You see, Paul was neither a Trinitarian nor a Unitarian. Okay, so from, from the greater context of the passage, I mean, it's clear that Paul believed that Christ was somehow divine, in fact, worthy of worship. Uh, it seems to me that when Paul wrote that Christ was both the morphe theu, the form of a god, and the morphe dulu, the form of a servant, he meant a physical god, a deity in the appearance of human flesh. However, Christ as Lord and Savior did not consider it robbery to be equal to the God precisely because he was not the God. Christ was the divine son of God whose level of authority on earth was equal to the God because the latter sent him to communicate his will, to die for the sins of humanity. So for Paul, Christ was not equal to God. Uh, sorry, Christ was equal to God, but not identical to God. And this is a very, very crucial distinction. I'll say it again. For Paul, Christ was equal to God, but not identical. Okay, therefore, Paul was a Hellenized, you know, Jewish, you know, soft polytheist, a henotheist, really. He was neither a Trinitarian nor a Unitarian. Now, the major difference be between Paul and John on one side and Philo on the other is that Paul and John believed that the wisdom or the logos had incarnated into human flesh as a Jewish Messiah, while Philo did not speak of specific incarnations. But Philo did say that the meaning of the statement, man was made in the image of God, he said that man was made in the image of the second God, the Logos, right? Adam was made in the, uh, uh, Adam was not made in the image of the God because the God is the supreme and absolutely transcendent mystery. You know, just as John said, no one has ever, no one has ever seen God because he is the absolutely transcendent mystery. The Logos who is seen reveals him. So even there, there's a bit of a similarity. And just one last thing before we get to, to Daniel, I'm sort of laying down this sort of, uh, theological uh, um, uh, foundation here is that, and this is all related to Daniel and the Son of Man, by the way, I'll get to that. In my view, and this is something that maybe uh, many Muslim du'at, many, many Muslim callers to the faith will not agree with, okay? In my view, Jesus is portrayed as a divine being, a God, in all four Gospels in the New Testament. Okay, this is my view, that he is the divine Son of God and Savior who will eventually judge mankind in all four Gospels. This is how the Gospels present him. He's not the God, right? The closest he gets to the God is in John, but he never actually reaches him. Uh, the, the New Testament, Jesus is clearly inferior to the God, whom he calls the Father, but he's also clearly not just a man, okay? So the Gospels were not written by Trinitarians, that's anachronistic, nor were they written by Pharisaic Jews, nor were they written by Jamesonian, you know, Nazarenes or Ebionites. So I don't believe that the four Gospels are teaching a theology that is totally consistent with Islam or Unitarian Christianity or traditional uh, Judaism. I believe that Jesus attains divine status in different ways in the Gospels, right? But nonetheless, he is a divine being in all four Gospels, right? Yeah, so, you know, you know how it is in Mark. Well, yeah, Paul, Mark, uh, Herman has uh, explained this in great detail. The, the, Jesus right. is God in some sense, and this is a crucial caveat. Yeah. Uh, nowhere is Jesus Yahweh in any of the Gospels. But he, yeah. it, according to the understandings of the use of this language in the greco Roman world, and even in Judaism at the time, the, the language of divinity was very elastic and could and did apply to human beings as well. And, and within that kind of matrix, Jesus does find a setting, but not as Yahweh. Jesus is never Yahweh in the New Testament, he would say. Yeah. 
Yeah, and we do see that evolution of Christology in the gospel. I mean, the earlier the gospel, the, the later Jesus becomes the divine son of God in the timeline. Or to put it another way, the yeah. later the gospel, the earlier Jesus becomes yeah. divine. Yes. Now, the, under, the underlying influences of Mark's gospel, which is the earliest of the quartet, are Greek metaphysics, Enochic tradition, and Pauline Christology. So Judaism is very much sort of in the back row. It's just kind of a veneer. Uh, the disciples in Mark are, are totally inept, unable to understand anything. You know, they're cowards who forsake Jesus and flee. Why? Uh, because they're Jews. Mark is making a statement here. Um, you will not understand Jesus, at least his Jesus, the Markan Jesus, through Jewish eyes. You need Greco-Roman eyes. And at the end of Mark, it is a Roman centurion who confesses, you know, at the foot of the cross, truly this man was a son of God. You, you see, he gets it, not the Jewish disciples. In yeah. Mark, Mary and Jesus' family think he's insane. You know, if Mary was visited by an angel, why does she think Jesus was insane? Why? Because she was a Jew. So Mark is telling us that, that Jesus is the son of God really in a Greco-Roman sense. Now, what is the Roman conception of a son of God? You know, Augustus was called the son of God. He was a divine being, but no Roman believed that Augustus was equal in all respects to Jupiter, to Zeus, who is the God. Okay, so keep that in mind. So, so, so when we study um, Jewish history, we see that, that pre-Christian North African and Palestinian Judaism had already been significantly influenced by Greek metaphysics ever since the beginning of the Hellenistic period in the 4th century BCE. So Philo and Paul and John, they're just sort of the tip of the iceberg. The invasion of all things Greek in Palestine uh, even led to a massive uh, inter-Jewish conflict, right? With Maccabean purists on one side, and then the, the Syro-Grecian, the, you know, the Seleucid Empire, along with their Jewish sympathizers on the other side. I mean, there were Jewish men, I don't know how on earth they were able to do this, but there were Jewish men who reversed their circumcisions so yeah. that they could look yeah, like they, Greeks. Yeah, they could wrestle in the gymnasium and stuff. I never got that, but I thought, best not yeah. to probe too much into these details, but somehow they did it. So, somehow they managed to pull it off, some kind well, of reconstructive so, yeah. surgery, and they were able to like, yeah, you know, wrestle in the gymnasium, compete in the Greek Olympics. Yeah. In the end, the Maccabees gained the upper hand, at least politically. Yep. And in 164 BCE, the temple was repaired and cleansed and rededicated to God, thus Hanukkah was born.